You are listening to Investing Matters, brought to you in association with London South East. This is the show that provides informative, educational and entertaining content from the world of investing. We do not give advice, so please do your own research. Hello and welcome to the Investing Matters podcast. My name is Peter Higgins and today I have the huge privilege of speaking with Alex Schlick, the former fund manager and currently the founder and managing director of Yellowstone Advisory, an investor relations advisory company. Hi Alex, how are you? Very good, thanks, Peter. Very good. Nice to uh, nice to be chatting to you this uh, lovely Friday morning. Lovely to speak with you too, Alex. Now, um, Alex, we've we've encountered each other. We've spoken with each other. We've shared some information, which is about educating others. So I'm, I'm really pleased to have you on this uh, on this Investing Matters podcast. I want to start our conversation, if I may, with regards to your early upbringing and what led to your interest in investing, if I may. Well, that's a, uh, an interesting question to start. And uh, like many of your other interviewees, I didn't think you'd start there. So I think I got a, an interest in investing back in the uh, 80s when I came across the uh, the concept of, um, uh, I guess, perks for shareholders. And um, the first share I actually bought was a company called Burton Group, um, where actually if you held uh, shares in Burton Group, you had... I think it was a 25 or 30 percent discount of purchases at Burton and Burton also owned principles for men. And uh, that was the first share that I bought. It was based on the, um, uh, the, the, the discounts that you got as a, as a shareholder um, and the actual as it happened that the shares actually did really well, which was probably not a good thing. Um, uh, but because uh, I hadn't done a lot of research into buying the stock in the first place. But uh, that's when I first got into uh, investing. And, uh, you know, I followed that um, by looking at other companies, um, you know, around that time. Brilliant. I love that. Um, so you, you went to uni, you went to Sheffield University and you got a, a Bachelor of Arts in Business Studies. So obviously that interest led to you doing business studies. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and tell us about the studies there. Did there any special segment that you specialised in within your studies there at Sheffield? That's something, you know, you always remember different teachers or professors in different times. And uh, I remember an American professor I had there called uh, Professor Jacobs. And he taught marketing and uh, he taught uh, entrepreneurship. And um, he also was a was an entrepreneur himself. He ran his own chain of stores um, it was, I think, called Bumps and Boobs. It was a sort of lingerie for the larger woman um, in and around um, uh, the Sheffield area. It had a number of stores, Sheffield, Rotherham, etc. And I remember he talked about innovations. And uh, he said one of his the best innovations that he had, he put in a chair and a daily mail into his shops. And he said that actually managed to keep um, his customers in the shops for a lot longer um, because the wife would come around with her husband, he would sit down on the on the chair, read the newspaper while she was happily um, choosing her her items. Um, and it was also a lesson, really, that uh, you know innovations can really be quite simple, um, uh, but they can make a really big difference to the performance of a business. Um, and uh, he had a number of um, um, you know very useful tips at the time about uh, you know trying to keep things simple and doing simple things really, really well. And that can have a really big impact on the performance of a business. That's absolutely brilliant. I love that. And you, now we see chairs, sofas in almost every retail outlet, large retail outlet, don't we, where the, usually the men are giving it, yeah, go on, you go and do what you want to do, you know, crack on with the shopping. So yeah, yeah. thank you very much for that. I love that idea. And innovation being kept simple is very important. Now, hmm. I want to talk now about your journey into the, fund management and wealth management business um, industry. You started your career as a trainee fund manager, Alex, in 1991 with Newton Investment Management. And you were then promoted to being a fund manager prior to your 25th birthday, right? So fast, fast track. Please share with us how you felt when you first landed your amazing role as a trainee and also what tasks you were given as a junior fund manager. Well, it was quite an interesting sort of step up, really, because... Um... I left university, I went traveling for a year, 
um, and I came back and I, I wanted to, to to find a job. I actually ended up working for a local business first um, called Harberton Plant and Machinery, which basically sold secondhand plant and container handling equipment to ports um, around the world. Um, actually, it was a good, it was a local business, very small. There was only a team of four of us there getting good experience working with the, the manager and owner of that business. But we had some significant uh, sales going out to the the Far East or the Middle East um, at the time of the first Gulf War. And all those sales um, were basically cancelled because it was impossible to get insurance for the transportation of those uh, floating docks as they were. So I was actually then made redundant in, um, in you know, early um, 91. Um, and um, I thought now it was, that, was, that was a kick that I needed to go into the city. I'd all said I wanted to work in the city. Um, and actually, one of my old uh, uh, classmates at, uh, at Sheffield was working for a recruitment company. So I gave him a call and he said, look, there's an opportunity to uh, join a very young um, investment company, Newton Investment Management. And at the time, I think when I joined, I was number number 70 or 73 on the um, uh, you know, on, in terms of the staff list. So I joined Newton. Um, it was founded by Stuart Newton, but also had some very impressive um uh, I guess, fund managers there. And the guy that I first worked for was a guy called Robert Shelton. Uh, he was from Yorkshire. He'd uh, trained as an accountant. So as you can imagine, he was particularly interested in uh, um, how much cash there was. Um, and uh, he was also um, interested in, you know, who was generating the cash, how it was generated. And he also was the first guy to sort of point me towards the balance sheet rather than the p and um, and I've never forgotten that, you know, he was always talking about, well, how much cash have they got on the balance sheet? You know, what's the change over the year? Let's try and understand how much cash they're actually making, not necessarily what they're saying um, in the p &L, but let's try and look at the cash position. Um, and he, yeah, he was my, uh, I guess, first mentor uh, when I started off. Um, he was also one of the interesting things he got me to do back then. I had to buy currencies and, you um, the, um, the currencies that, uh, you know, we had multiple currencies back then. It was before the uh, time of the euro and I had to buy Italian lira. Um, and as you can imagine, you know, one pound to two thousand lira, there were lots of noughts on, uh, on the calculations that we had to buy. And he stressed to me, and I've, again, I've learned this and remembered it ever since, the importance of checking your data, checking the numbers, going through it again, and then doing some sort of sense check. Um, I mean, if you had sort of 2% of the you know, the billion of assets being bought, you know, that would be that would be 20 million. But in Italian lira, that would be 40 billion lira, um, you know, 10 noughts. <laughs> um, it's easy to make a mistake, make a mistake. And, you know, Rob really taught me to check through the numbers, check them again to make sure they're right. Better to spend a bit more time at the start rather than end up buying the uh, the wrong amount. So, um, yeah, he was a, certainly a good person to work for. And, uh, you know, gave me some of the foundations of my sort of, uh, I guess, the, the things I use now in terms of how I invest. Brilliant. You covered two of my questions there. A, what, you, what your roles were. B, what you, who your mentor was as well. Um, with regards to Rob, and you said about your greater, greater learning, when you went in there as a, as a trainee, I, I'm thinking about all the people that aspire to become fund managers. It's obviously quite daunting going in, into a large industry, into a large company as a 20-odd-year-old. What do you remember back then, you know, as a youngster going in that you think, crackly, if, if I knew then what I know now, how would, how would that make a massive difference for you? Well, I just remember joining a, a young company full of lots of young, um, ambitious people wanting to do really well um, alongside in a number of very talented individuals that, uh, um, you know, wanted to drive the business forward. And that's not just from, you know, Stuart Newton, who, who led the business. Um, but that said, there were other fan managers there as well. Um, Rob Shelton, Richard Horlick, um, people that have been around the city for a long period of time who were, you know, great mentors. I, I think, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I sort of remember is sometimes it's just worth having a go. Don't necessarily be, be scared of, of, uh, of, of failure. Um, you know, you can learn from your failures, um, but sometimes it's worth just, just having a go and, you um, you know, trying to, you know, you know, having a go and trying to do your best, basically. And that's, I think Newton was a good environment for, for doing that. 
Love that reply. Now, whilst you were a fund manager at Newton, tell us about your best experience whilst you were there and something that you remember thinking, wow, that was just amazing. I can't believe that happened whilst I was whilst I was there. Um, I know there were lots of very good experiences and, and I came away from Newton with some fantastic friends um, that uh, I'm still friends with today. And I think that's that's something I really did keep with me is the guys, um, you know, right across uh, the firm. But as I said, I'm still still friendly with sort of five or six of them to, today. We still meet up regularly and talk about stocks and and uh, and uh, and joke and, and do other things. Um, I mean, one of my first fund managers... Uh, couple of fun management experiences there which, which was just incredibly enjoyable one was um we were big shareholders in a, in a small company and uh someone asked me to attend the shareholder meeting with their top four shareholders and i was probably in the first sort of six months there and we went to a house on chain walk um in uh, in chelsea it was it was was i think originally one of the guinness families um entertaining locations or attain, entertaining residences in wow. um, in in london it was the chairman of the company the chief exec and the three major shareholders uh of which we were one i didn't know a lot about it and we were treated to you know a fantastic meal and um uh i remember afterwards we retired to the smoking room for cigars and i'd never had a cigar before and it was all just like a very a surreal experience for a young guy um you know coming up and sort of experiencing things for the first time so that was a pretty, uh, pretty special experience uh, back then. I, I'm not sure it happens too often these days, but for me, that was something I, I remember. But it, it is, I think, generally the friendships that we learned, you know, on the job and, um, you know, after work, which are, are still with me, still with me now. Brilliant. Love that. I love that response. Now, Alex, you took a bit of time out and you went away to um, America to do some academia, MBA, Masters in Management degree. Why did you choose to go and do that? MBA in America, or was it just placed across in America? No, I spent, um, you know, I spent two years at uh, the Kellogg Graduate School of Management um, um, in Evanston, just outside Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, funnily enough, I'd always wanted to do an MBA. I found a, a piece of paper from my school the other day that from the graduate, uh, the careers officer who, who who said, well, if you do want to go to the, uh, you know, do an MBA, you've got to do it in America because that's where the, the best schools are. Um, and, and back then, um, I think they're, yeah, they're the best MBA schools were in America. I decided I wanted to try and get myself into the best place I could do. Um, Kellogg, was, Kellogg was ranked number one in terms of the top um, graduate school then. I actually... I had met a number of MBA graduates in London at the time. Um, a number of Americans who I came across as being incredibly friendly, very welcoming, and just really encouraging me to, you know, again, to apply to the best schools. And um, I, I did. I applied to five schools in the States. Um, I was offered a place at Kellogg along with a couple of others. And as I said, that at the time, Kellogg was a top-ranked business school. And so I, I decided, to, decided to go there. And I had an absolute you know, absolute brilliant time. The um, Americans were incredibly friendly, um, uh, very welcoming. And um, the location of, of Kellogg, which is on the shores of Lake Michigan, just north of Chicago, you know, it's a brilliant place. Brilliant. Now, I, I love the fact that you travelled and gave you, gave you some other cultural experiences other than, you know, Sheffield, you know, the, the grim north, as we call it. You know, I'm not far away from there where I was. Sheffield brought up was Northern. good, too. Sheffield, so, Sheffield was a lot of fun, too. But it certainly wasn't Evanston or, you know, it wasn't America. Absolutely. So it's nice to have that diversity. Now, Alex, you, you then returned and you took a, some other jobs. But then obviously, eventually, you were drawn back into the investment industry. And um, Collins and Stewart being the mainstay, kind of called Genuity and Salem for um, so just want to talk about that, the experiences during that time, and then we're going to talk a bit about Yellowstone. So tell us about that for us, please, for a little while. So, um, yeah, I came back. I worked for a consultancy firm, uh, Maricon, um, which was uh, uh, there's a bit of a theme for some of the companies I worked for, which is really about, uh, you know, a focus on, you know, returns, not necessarily profitability, but, uh, you know, actually cash flow returns. And Maricon had a concept called economic profit. And, uh, you know, that basically measures the, um, I guess, takes into account the capital that's required to generate profits in a business. And um, 
that was a really good experience for me. But I wanted to get into um, a more entrepreneurial environment. It was a time of the dot-com boom. And I joined actually first a company called Graginet, and um, uh, which was a you know an online uh, graduate recruiter, one of the first online businesses out there. Unbelievable experience. You know, we took the team from uh, a team of four to a team of, of, of 20 in the space of 12 months. But actually, the dot-com boom was beginning to, to crash a bit. We found it more difficult to raise uh, funds. Um, and, and actually, the experience I had was that it was really important for me to be selling at the time, because actually, without selling, it meant that we, if we didn't have enough revenues. We had to make someone redundant. So, uh, you know, it, it gave me... Um, yeah, great experience in selling and the courage to take rejection and um, ability to um, build up my own resilience. And I knew, you know, at that time, if I didn't sell something that week, I'd have to make someone redundant at the end of the week. And um, wow. we did, we did, you know, I so said we went from four to 20 and then we went back down to four people. Um, and so I needed to exit that. And that's when I, I joined Colin Stewart, um, which was a, um, young broker. It hadn't been around for too long. It came out of Singer and Friedlander. Um, and I joined Colin Stewart in 2001. And I joined what was called their Quest Desk. And Quest was a product that was set up by Terry Smith. Um, it modeled something called cash flow return on invested capital. And again, it took into account that the capital took into account the capital that was um, required in order to generate the, the profits of the business and how long that capital could be used for. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, that, that quest product, you know, was a brilliant product back then. You know, I know the guys on the team now, it's still a brilliant product now. Um, as I said, it looks more than just the, at the PL. it looks at the, the cash flow generated from the, the businesses. Um, and, um, you know, I was at Cullen Stewart, which was then later taken over by Canaccord for around about 12, 13 years. I started off on the quest desk and, um, you know, work there, understanding how that model worked, understanding how you could interpret the data and use that to help make recommendations on companies. Um, yeah, actually, one of the one of the best Quest Quest used to run a lot of screens um, to try and you know screen the markets for which companies would fit various criteria. Um, and one of their best screens, and I know they ran it again recently, was something called the LBO Free Cash Flow Screen, which sort of looked like a normalised level of profits. Um, took into account um, a normalized capital expenditure and then looked at the sort of uh, the, the, the LBO free cash flow yields. And it identified, I remember the first time we came across it was back in 2003, did a brilliant job of identifying companies that uh, might get taken over um, um, because actually they have a good long term track record of um, you know, generating solid cash flows and may potentially the share price might be depressed at that time or. Uh, the cash flows may be temporarily depressed for sort of short term reasons. Um, I said, I think they ran that screen again. I know they run it regularly. I think it was quoted in the, in the Times a few weeks back. Um, but it has done a phenomenal job over time of identifying um, companies that might get taken over because actually, you know, they are uh, looking particularly attractive based on their long term cash flow generating potential. Um, so, yeah, now I was at uh, Colin Stewart for, for 12, 13 years and started off in the Quest desk and then moved on to sales and then ended up running the uh, the, the UK sales team. Brilliant. I, I love that. I want, I want to, if I may, just go back on, on two points there. You, you subtly mentioned, but didn't really, didn't really expand very much on the fact you're working with Terry Smith. Terry Smith, there's only one Terry Smith in the investment industry, so I'm assuming it's the same one. Tell us about that experience working with, with and alongside him. Yeah, I mean, Terry is one of the brightest persons, the brightest people that I've ever worked with. Um, you know, he combines raw horsepower um, with an incredible ability to focus on the, in the important parts of an investment decision. Um, you know, he's a he's a high, hard taskmaster. He's got incredibly high standards. Um, but again, you know, you work alongside, you know, very talented people. You work, learn an awful lot from them. Um, and as I said, you know, Terry... Um, in, was instrumental in, in developing this Quest product, um, which focused on you know cash flow returns, um, and I think he's always himself been focused on that. And you can see now in the way he manages his money for Fund Smith, you know he looks for companies. He used to talk about it back then. Look for companies that can generate high returns on invested capital, and can invest their invested capital 
um, and grow over time. Um, and those companies we we call compounders. And you know, I think um, you know Nick Linsell and Michael Train they use that same sort of approach as well, looking for high quality, high return companies, um, and um, that could, that can grow the capital base. Um, so those are really good companies, not just companies that can beat their cost of capital, but you can beat the cost of capital and grow that over time. Um, it's a um, a pretty good formula for success. Now, often those companies look quite expensive, but um, uh, they tend to, you know, I guess they beat the fade. You know, most companies fade to a norm over time and, and you're looking for companies that you think might be able to just beat that fade. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, working with, with Terry was, was, a, was, a, was an experience. Brilliant, love that response. Now, and the other second aspect I wanted to touch on was the importance of cash flow and being able to generate cash flow, continue to generate cash flow despite different headwinds. And you touched also regarding back to when you were at uni, your professor was saying to you about looking at the balance sheet, two core components which investors seem to overlook the importance of. Can you just stress a little bit more about the importance of cash flow and balance sheet for us, please? Well, I guess, um, you know, a lot of companies, um, you know, are able to generate, you know, profits, but an accounting profit doesn't necessarily take into account you know, it's not the same thing as a cash profit um, and an accounting profit uh, might take off, you know, um, you know, depreciation. Um, you know, there may be some development expenditure, which is expensed, um, which obviously is cash for the company that's going out of the business. But again, you know, so the, the company could be actually quite cash negative, um, but look like it's a profitable company. So I think you just need to need to combine the two, basically, um, to understand. And actually investing is, is good. Um, we need to understand that actually the money's going out now and the returns might not come in for two or three years. So you know, it's not to suggest that you shouldn't invest and develop, but just to understand that, you know, while you're doing that, the profits and the cash may not have a, there may be a mismatch between the profits reported and the cash that's actually generated. Um, and, uh, you know, looking at, looking at the, the, the balance sheet gives you an understanding of the capital that's required to generate those profits where cash is, you know, the state of the cash and, and what's happening to working capital. Um, and as I said, you know, from Rob Shelton at Newton through, you know, Terry Smith and others, they've always had a, a good focus on, on, on those components, which I think are a key part of making good investment decisions. I love that response, Alex. Thank you ever so much. Now, from kind of called Stuart, sorry, kind of called Genuity to Sal Salem, you moved on. So you moved on to Salem 4. I wanted to ask you, Alex, to share with our listeners your investing style as a fund manager and how that differs and how you were then being, your investing style was being measured as a fund manager. We were running uh, UK funds. They were sort of a, um, all part of the, I guess, um, UK all company sector. Um, I think our style, we were very much bottom up stock pickers. Um, it was a team-based approach. Um, so there were three fund managers there that made the decisions um, and we made them collectively. You needed two out of the three fund managers to uh, make those decisions. I'm not entirely sure that the team-based approach works. I think when things are going well, team-based team approach works fine, but things are going more you know, badly with individual stocks. It's sometimes difficult to actually make the decisions to... Um, to cut a position and to admit that actually your, your investment thesis hasn't turned out as, as, as planned. Um, but where we tended to look, as I said, bottom up, stock picking approach, um, looking for undervalued opportunities, um, you know, relative to their prospects in, in, in our view. And um, we, yeah, we, we uh, that, that was the approach that we took. I love that. Thank you very much. Now, how does your current role and also being a private investor differ to how you invest now compared to when you're a fund manager Alex? I think uh, you know as a fund manager you have to report either monthly or quarterly to your um, to your clients and therefore um, you take a lot longer making your decisions because you know if you purchase something it's going to be in the portfolio for a long period of time because you can't shop and change um, because you can't go to a, you know, a quarterly meeting with a client and justify why you bought something and then um, reverse 
you know, reverse engines, you know, a month or two later. I think as a private investor, it's much easier to make uh, um, um, quicker decisions, to change your mind, decide you haven't done the right thing. Um, if you want to, and I think I have, I know that's not everyone's style, but I, you know, I'll buy something and I may, may, may then sell it a month later if I don't think it's working out. So I take much, I can take much shorter, um, I guess, time periods now. Um, I think the other thing is in terms of, and it's particularly relevant now, the liquidity in the market, I think is really, really difficult. Um, so as a, as a fund manager, you know, you are really restricted to the size of market cap that you can go down to. You know, we found it probably difficult to buy things under sort of 500 million. We had, you know, a couple of stocks below that. Um, but um, the liquidity is very difficult in the sort of small and mid cap world when you've got, you know, reasonable sums that you're playing with. Now, as a private investor, it's much easier to go down to stocks that are, you know, 10, 20, 30 million because you can just take a, you know, a small position size in that. Um, and that makes a, a big difference of as being a private investor, being able to, um, you know, participate in the smaller companies world, which I think is increasingly dominated by retail investors, simply because large institutions are withdrawing from smaller companies areas, and they're certainly finding it more difficult with the lack of liquidity to actually build up the position sizes that they want to have, and that will actually make a difference to the overall performance of their portfolio. Great reply, I love that. Now, you moved on, you set up your own shop, as they call it. You're the founder and managing director of um, Yellowstone Advisory. So tell us about the role that you play in the market and how you are helping with the communication um, with the retail investors. So, um, yeah, and I founded Yellowstone Advisory back in uh, 2017. Um, it's an investor relation and corporate uh, advisory business. Um, we help listed companies um, with their investor communication, helping them refine the investment messaging um, and then helping them communicate that investment messaging to both institutional investors and, and, and retail investors. We work with a number of retained clients um, and we work with um, other clients on sort of one-off project basis. Um, uh, you know, we thought that the retail investor base was an important one to try and connect with, particularly for smaller companies. So more recently, I guess, you know, since probably the last two or three years, we've been running um, either face-to-face -face events before the pandemic, connecting smaller companies with, um, with retail investors as well as you know, running webinars for um, listed companies to connect with retail investors, giving them an opportunity to get across their investment story, and also giving retail investors an opportunity to ask their questions. I know a lot of retail investors often find that they get over, overlooked, they're ignored by listed companies. And this is a great way for them to you know, have their questions answered by the people who are running the businesses, potentially you know, running money for them. I think it's I think it's brilliant what you do, and I've been I've had the pleasure of being invited to a few of those um, events face to face, and and also on on this on the online seminars because you've got some blue chips. You've not mentioned any names, there. you've been a bit coy, um, Alex. Some blue chip names. You go to those AGMs, or you go to their their events without you know the availability of doing it via Yellowstone. You'd never get the opportunity to ask a question to the CEO or the CFO. So I think it's fantastic you're doing that. Please share with us some of the blue chip and um, FTSE and AIM clients you're currently working with, please. So, yeah, we've got uh, a, a number of events that we've organised. Um, we had one this week for Halma, which is a, a really high quality company, consistently, again, generating returns um, above its cost of capital and, and growing the, the, the capital base. And Charles King, the head of investor relations there, has always been a keen supporter of, of Yellowstone um, and indeed ShareSock. Um, and getting the message out to um, retail investors. But uh, in addition to Halma, we've done work for the likes of Roadtalk. We've actually got a webinar with Roadtalk coming up in, a, in a, about six weeks' time. Again, a high-quality British engineering company. Um, but other companies like you know, Lloyds Bank, Sainsbury, some of the smaller companies like Chemair, Check It, Oxford Biodynamics. So a whole host of different companies that we've run webinars for, um, in the past and, and going forward and all of those are interested in getting the message out to retail investors and helping um you know spread the word that they are also listening to retail investors and you know want to get their feedback and understand you know what they like and don't like about about their companies 
Yeah, I, th- I think it's really good that you're doing that work. And that's what we're trying to do here on the Investing Matters podcast to try and educate and inform um, our, our listeners. Now, Alex, I know you've got, similar to myself, a, a passion for innovative small companies. How do you filter down from the vast number of companies that are out there to the one or two that you go, I'm going to put some money in that one there? I think that's just a very difficult question. I, I don't, or maybe the answer is I don't have a clear process um, to for, for that basis. I mean, I think you have to you look at a lot of companies, um, and you know sometimes some of them catch your attention. and You really want to do some more work on them. I think you obviously also have to accept you'll probably miss a lot of opportunities, and I think that's a good thing as well. You can't expect to find every good opportunity or, or find you know everything that's out there. I think when I come across something that I look as interesting and it's, and it's either because a friend has mentioned it to me or I've read about it and it seems to fit, you know, a trend that I think is becoming important. Um, I just end up doing some more work on it and, and spending the time to understand the company a bit more, understand the valuation, you know, trying if I can understand the people. Um, and actually these days, you know, um, you know, go online and, and, and look at the original documentation, you know, read the, re, read the report and accounts. But I think the actual filtering process is quite difficult. I mean, I have a number of screens that I set up for, for different purposes. I don't think they've necessarily really highlighted particularly smaller companies that might be changing or smaller growth companies. Those have really come up by, you know, discussions with fellow investors um, and for whatever reason, we think they might be quite interesting and then going and then doing further work on them to, to find out if indeed there might be an opportunity to, to invest in them because they do have some, you know, attractive products growing in a particularly attractive way or, the you know, there's a valuation gap which looks particularly attractive. Thank you for that reply. Now, Alex, once you've identified that company and you want to put the money down, do you tend to scale in to a position size that you want? Or do you just go, that's it, I'm going to put X amount in and make a, a purchase and a lump? No, I, I always uh, scale in over a period of time. Um, I think it's very difficult to know exactly, you know, the right time to be buying a stock or exactly when you hit the bottom and you, you, or, or, you know, hit, 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 hit the right time to be purchasing it. So, you know, depending on how, I, how much I like it, I will try and buy it over a period of weeks or indeed months. And... Actually, there are some stocks I, I guess I bought over a period of years. You know, it's a question of sometimes really liking the idea, but maybe not having quite the confidence to build a full position. So buying a little bit first, waiting for the results to come through, waiting for the update that suggests they are delivering on what they said they were going to do, and then adding to the position. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I do. I, I, I like to buy it over time and I like to buy it as my confidence improves um, as they continue to report good or better better results than we're expecting. Thank you. Now, Alex, lots of books are written on how to invest, where to invest, fundamentals, quality shares, investing psychology, even macroeconomics. Yet very few books are written expressing education on and for investors on when to sell. Given your 30 years experience, what indicators and little nuggets are you looking for in the noise that's out there regarding stocks and companies that say to you, actually, Alex, it might be time to top slice or move on regarding a company, regarding your own personal investments? Well, I think there are, there are a couple of things, are there? One is position size, which is sometimes a position gets so large in your portfolio. And obviously that's a good thing because the stocks have gone up that you might yeah. think, I, I don't want to you know, have that amount of uh, exposure to a particular company. I love that company. It's done really well for me. But, you know, if I want to have a cap on my position size, when it gets there, I might want to take some money off the table. Um, You know, I guess, you know, run your winners, cut your losers. Um, But I don't always do that because it's hard sometimes to cut your losers because you think you know something that someone else doesn't and actually shouldn't really be down there. But, you know, I think in principle, you know, it's it's a good thing to do. Um, and I remember dealing with some traders early in my career and they had a phenomenal record on just cutting losers, basically, you know. Um, and it's a discipline that I suspect very good traders have. In fact, I know very good traders have that have that have that discipline of cutting losers. Um, I, um, I, you know, I, I'm I like to look about what's happening at the operating level. 
Um, if the company is still performing well and still doing what they said they would do, I may well see a you know a falling share price as a chance to add. And as I said, I don't buy my full position right at the start. I may see the falling share price as a chance to add. Um, but my main reasons for selling, I think, are you know if the investment thesis hasn't panned out, um, if the company's actually had a had a hiccup and just and you know, things aren't going as well as we thought they were going to do when we made the investment in the first place. Um, or indeed, if it gets to a level where um, in my portfolio that the size of the position is, is I guess, too large against my risk parameters. Um, now, as I said, that's a good thing to happen because it means the shares have done really well. So I don't mind that happening. But, I, you know, I do tend to try and run my run my winners um, and, uh, you know, you know cut, cut, cut the losers. Brilliant. I love that. Now, I, I noted in the, the, the conversation that we've had previously that, you know, like yourself, I, I support and you support quite a number of charities. Um, we're very good at um, paying it forward as such. I wanted to talk about that briefly, the ones that you're, you're interested in. I also note that you're also supporting the Ukrainian family. So I wanted to talk about that as well, Alex. Just share some of the about that for us, please. So yeah, no, I'll stop. I guess we we have a Ukrainian family staying with us at the moment. It's a it's a mum and uh, two young daughters, six and nine. Um, we didn't think about it for too long. We talked about it as a family. Um, we wanted our our children to be supportive. But we've got older children, one who's left for university, and she's been absolutely brilliant because um, you know her room has been used by the Ukrainian family, but she didn't hesitate to say, yes, that would be great. They could use her room. Um, and then I guess my sons had to adopt to a slightly different, uh, you know, setup in the house. He's in the sixth form. You know, he didn't want to, we didn't want him to up, upset his studies. Um, but again, he's been uh, fully, fully supportive. Um, and, you know, we decided to do this together, my wife and I and the family, and actually, is my wife has been an absolute star. Um, she's helped now. She's helped now. I think almost a dozen families find host families okay. here in the UK. Um, completed many, many visa applications um, and all the other um, universal credit and other form fillings, you know, that the government requires. So she has really been the absolute star, um, and she just sort of uh, very methodically gets on um, doing these things. And you know, having this uh, family with us, it's been a it's been a good experience. They've been with us for about about two months. You know, we do some things together. Uh, we do things separately. We you know we'll eat together. We've learned uh, we've eaten some uh, eaten some Ukrainian food, um, things like borscht and you know different salads that we wouldn't have. Um, and you know, it's been quite wonderful to see two young children you know play on my um my wife's old swing you know which which is now 60 years old um and i've reassembled it in the garden and you know hearing the laughter from kids playing there has been it's been good so that's what probably been one of the, the best thing hearing sort of happy happy chatter uh laughing kids in, in the gardens so that mm. that's been good so with that you know our ukrainian experience has been has been very successful so far and we've really enjoyed that I think the charities that I've tended to support have been sort of education um, type charities, believing that, you know, giving everyone a, a good education um, is a, is a, yeah, is an excellent opportunity. Um, so either individually, we've supported a number of education charities and uh, um, we've also, I guess, supported a number of um I, I guess African charities, which target to um, um, you know help people grow themselves out of poverty. One of them has been Build Africa, where they build schools um, in Uganda and Kenya, um, and um, th those are the sort of charities that we've 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 supported over the years. No, that's brilliant. I love the fact you've reassembled your wife's swing from what she had 60 years ago that's fantastic you well, it tells fantastic. You how, been in the family 60 years i should say not that your wife's 60 years of age yeah that's well it tells, you how, it, it tells you how well built it was uh, it's a simple a-frame swing and i uh, said so it's <laughs> over 60 years old now and it was reassembled it's used by my my our kids uh, my wife mm -hmm. when she was a child and uh, and now a new set of uh, a new younger family are using it which is which is quite nice brilliant now I'm, I'm interested here because it because it says that you you're playing cricket, coaching, and watching. I want to hear about the the coaching side of it, the the, the size of the team, 
what you're learning from actually coaching? Because I, I think sometimes when you're doing something, you learn more about the sport as well. Yeah, I think my, actually my coaching days have just come to the end because my son stopped playing Colts cricket and he's into adults cricket, so oh. I don't coach anymore. But I have been coaching for the last probably 10 years, actually. Um, and, you know, when they start playing any sport at sort of age five or six, um, they uh, have a tremendous ability to learn things and they make unbelievable progress. So that's, you know, that's a satisfying thing about coaching. Um, and so, yeah, no, being coaching cricket, I'm not really a great cricketer, uh, but I'm very, I'm, I'm, I love the game. My dad introduced it to me when I was uh, younger and I remember going to see my, you know, first match I think in the, the World Cup final between uh, West Indies and uh, and India, and that gave me um, the passion for cricket. Um, and so, yeah, I love coaching. Um, I play also for a, 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 a local dad's team, um, and we play some midweek sort of 2020 matches. Um, and, of course, I like watching it as well. Um, so, yeah, all aspects of that. But, it, you know, the coaching is an area where, as I said, you can give them some drills to do. You can give them some techniques. You know, some will pick it up quicker than others. But, you know, you look at the start of the season and then you move to the end of the season, you will see progress across all of the children that have been in your group. And it's just a great feeling to see the progress that, uh, that people make. Brilliant. Now, Alex, we've been on this call a little while, so I'm going to conclude our, our interview here with one final question. As a former fund manager, as a private investor, what's been your greatest learning and what nuggets would you share for any investor to say, this is what you should be doing as an investor to be successful long term. Um, so one of my um, great investing friends, my one of my great friends was a guy that I met at Newton called Nick Moss, a good friend of mine um, and a very good investor. And I talk ideas with him all the time. Now, he's very big on trends and. Um, and I think sometimes that's quite a good thing as a, as a point in the right direction to think about what trends are happening, what trends are uh, going to be relevant going forward. You know, he was one of the first guys that picked up on the, for me, on the sustainability trend. Um, and, you know, we ended up buying impacts, you know, impacts at asset management, you know, over, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um and um, I would I would suggest, you know, there are lots of pieces of information out there. But, you know, if you can think you can pick up some useful trends um, and I think sustainability is one of them, um, whether it's going to be solar, battery storage, smart metering, you know, electric charging, hydrogen or fuel cells, you know, to think about, um, you know, what trends you think are going to be relevant going forward and what companies you think might be, um, you know, relevant for playing playing some of those trends. Um, and the other thing I would, would say as well, which is come back to the cash, cash component, the cash element we talked about earlier, that's a really important part of investing. Try and understand what, um, you know, how the company's generating cash. Um, do they have the opportunity to grow the cash generation characteristics? Um, and is that a company you think you'd be happy owning in five, 10 years time? And that's a starting point for thinking about whether that's a useful investment or something you might want to invest in and do some more work in. Brilliant. I love that. Alex, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, mate. Uh, looking forward to seeing you soon. And give my love to your good wife. And thank you ever so much for putting out and giving some kindness to everybody and also the, the Ukrainian flam family out there as well with you. Um, that was Alex Flake, the founder and managing director of Yellowstone Advisory. Alex, take care, mate. Take care. God bless. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you for having me this morning and uh, really appreciate uh, being with you on this podcast. Very welcome, sir.